بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلاة وسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to lesson number two of the video series Arabic Grammar for Understanding the Quran. In this lesson, inshallah, we will be covering a number of different topics. But I want to begin this lesson with a very brief discussion of what I would call the terminology question or the terminology dilemma. And this is a source, a very common source of confusion for students. When students use English grammar terminologies to describe Arabic grammar. Now, of course, you can probably see why this is an issue, and that's because English and Arabic are two very different languages. They are distinct from one another, and each has its own unique terminologies to describe its own unique grammar categories. Now, for the beginner student who has no knowledge of Arabic grammar terminologies, he or she has no choice but to rely upon and resort uh, resort to, exclusively resort to English terms, and this will cause some confusion. So I want to address this issue um, right off the bat and discuss ways that we can deal with it. Next, we will dive into the core components of today's lesson. I will start with an introduction to al damair which are the personal pronouns in Arabic, followed by an overview of al-af'al, the verbs in Arabic. We will discuss briefly how verbs are conjugated. We will discuss also the root system, the system in which words are derived from basic root letters. And we will also discuss briefly the concept of verb forms or verb patterns in Arabic also called awzan. Last but not least, we will begin learning how to conjugate verbs in this particular lesson. And we will be working with the form one verb and conjugating for the past tense. Conjugating the form one verb into the past tense for the singular personal pronouns. And in the next lesson, lesson number three, inshallah, we will be conjugating the form one verb for the past tense for the plural personal pronouns. So let's begin, insha'Allah. Topic number one, the terminology question. So in lesson number one, in the previous lesson, I told you that all Arabic words can be divided into three large categories, and they are namely the ism, the fi'l, and the harf. Ismun wa fi'lun wa harfun. And I defined these words for you in lesson number one. I told you that the ism was a noun or a pronoun, that the fi'l was a verb, and that the harf I defined using the very vague English term particle. And I mentioned that most English prepositions fall under this category right here. Now here are the plural forms of these words. The plural form of ism is asma. The plural form of fi'l is af'al. And the plural form of harf is huruf. These three plurals are broken plurals, if you remember from our discussion of plurals in lesson number one. Why are they broken? Because in order to form them, we had to take apart the singular form and we had to introduce new letters and we also had to change the short vowel markings, the harakat. That's why these plurals are considered jama' taksir, broken plurals. So from ism, we have asma, which we, we've added an alif and a hamza. From fi'l, we have af'al, in which we've added an alif. And harf becomes huruf, in which we've added a waw. We've added a waw. At this point, I want to modify this diagram for you a little bit. And that's because I've made a few small quote-unquote mistakes in lesson number one. And I want to tell you why I made these mistakes because this ties in directly with the terminology question, the topic at hand. So number one, I told you that most English prepositions fall under the category of huruf. In reality, most English prepositions actually go here. They go under the category of asma, and only some English prepositions fall under the category of huruf. So that's mistake, quote-unquote mistake number one. Number two, 
was more of an omission. So I forgot to mention that adjectives are actually considered asma in Arabic. So adjectives fall under this category of asma. Now, why did I make these two quote unquote mistakes? And that's because of a pitfall that I was unaware of and that I want to warn you of at this point. And that pitfall resulted because I was thinking in terms of English grammar. I was talking about Arabic grammar, but I was thinking in terms of English grammar. And I was doing so because as I made the slides for lesson number one, I wanted to think of a way to present the material such that English speaking students can easily relate and understand whatever concepts I was trying to teach. So I used such words as nouns, pronouns, verbs, prepositions, etc. And these are all English terminologies. But English grammar works very differently from Arabic grammar. For instance, in English, a noun, a preposition, and an adjective are three very distinct words. They are distinct and separate categories. If a word is a noun, it is not a preposition and it is not an adjective. However, notice in Arabic how all three nouns, prepositions, and adjectives can all fall under one category. They are all related in a sense. They are all considered a smut. Furthermore, in English, prepositions all belong to this one single group. But in Arabic, we have two different groups. We have huruf and asma. And the confusion can continue. And it will continue if we think exclusively in terms of Arabic. If we think in terms of English. Okay? If we think in terms of English grammar, we will be very confused when we talk about Arabic grammar because the two languages are different. So I made this mistake in lesson number one. I was thinking in terms of English, so I put prepositions under the category of huruf, and I forgot to mention that adjectives are asma, because in English, prepositions and adjectives do, don't belong in the same group as nouns. So here we are. The terminologies and categories in Arabic can be very different from those in English. We should try not to think in terms of English grammar. We should try really hard not to do this. And inshallah, we'll make that transition, that transition away from English and to Arabic together, inshallah. And by this, I mean eventually we will be using Arabic terminologies exclusively and not using any English terminologies. And when we use Arabic terminologies exclusively, that will bring clarity to our discussion of Arabic grammar. We will no longer be confused because we are flip-flopping back and forth between English and Arabic. So that's enough of that. Let's dive into the grammar, the grammar topics for today's lesson. Subject number two, introduction to al-dhamair. Al-dhamair, the singular form of which is al-dhamir refers to the personal pronoun. So personal pronouns are such pronouns as I, you, he, she, or they. Like in English, we say I, you, he, she, or they. Or we can have English pronouns like me, him, her, or them. al dhamair refer to all of these pronouns. And the singular form is dhamir. Dhamir al dhamair This is a jama' taksir, a broken plural. Al-Dhamair in Arabic can be divided into two large umbrella groups or two large categories. And I want you to memorize these two groups. So number one, we have Al-Dhamair Al-Munfasila, Al-Dhamair Al-Munfasila. And number two, we have Al-Dhamair Al-Muttasila, Al-Dhamair Al-Muttasila. What do these categories mean? Al-Munfasila means separate or detached. Al-Dhamair al-Munfasila are what I would call standalone pronouns. These are pronouns that are not attached to any other word. They exist as standalone units. In contrast, Al-Dhamair al-Muttasila are attached pronouns. That's what the word al-Muttasila means. These are pronouns that are joined or annexed to other words. So I have some examples here. Under this category of standalone personal pronouns, we have huwa, which means he, 
hiya, which means she, whom, which means they, and ana, which means I. These are again standalone pronouns, al al munfasila. Over here we have examples of attached pronouns. So here there is the expression or phrase fihi, fihi, which means in it. This is composed of two separate words, fi, which means in, and he, which means it. He is the attached pronoun. It is fixed to the word fi, so we get fi he. Example number two, li annahu, li annahu means because he. Again, this is composed of two different words. Li anna means because, and who is the attached pronoun referring to he. Example number three. We have Barabuhu. Barabuhu. This means they hit him. They hit him. This is composed again of two words. Barabu in black means they hit. And the ha is an attached pronoun meaning him. Barabuhu, they hit him. And the last example, Kitabuhu. Kitabuhu is composed of two words, kitab, which means book, and ha, on the end, the attached pronoun signifies possession, in this case. Kitabuhu means his book. In each of these examples, I've highlighted for you in red the, the attached pronoun, which in this case is a ha. In each example, we have an attached pronoun highlighted in red, and that's the ha. Notice how this pronoun has a different meaning and serves a different function depending on what word it is attached to. It can have a wide variety of different meanings and functions. Now in this particular lesson, in lesson number two, we will focus exclusively on al the standalone pronouns which are not attached to any word. And in future lessons, we will discuss al in more detail. Al-Dhamair al in Arabic are 12 unique standalone pronouns. 12 unique standalone pronouns. You might be asking yourself at this point, why are there so many? And that's because Arabic is concerned with several different factors. Factor number one is person. So in Arabic, we can have the first person, which refers to the perspective of one who is speaking, I or we. We can have the second person, which is the perspective of the one being spoken to, the one being addressed, namely you. And we can have the third person, and that refers to the perspective of one who is absent, the one being spoken about, he or she. Arabic is also concerned with number. You may recall from lesson number one that we discussed mufrad, meaning singular the dual or muthanna and the plural three or more or jama in arabic and arabic is also concerned with gender the masculine mudhakar and the feminine muannas and these three factors are all accounted for in al-dhamair al-munfasila the personal standalone pronouns and that's why there are 12 of them so here is a chart it's the full chart of all of the al-dhamair al-munfasila, of all the personal standalone pronouns. And I've added for you these headings on the sides to help you with the organization. So here we have person. The bottom row refers to the first person pronouns. The middle two rows belong to the second person. And the top two rows belong to the third person. By column, we have organization based on number. On the far right column, we have the singular pronouns. In the center, we have the dual pronouns. And on the far left, we have the plural pronouns. And of course, pronouns are also divided by gender, masculine and feminine. It's not as bad as it looks, actually. It may seem intimidating at first, but trust me, it's not as bad as it looks. For one, there's no gender differentiation for the first person. So masculine and feminine is not differentiated for the first person. When you are referring to yourself, Anna, you say I, regardless of whether, of regards of your gender, you would use the same pronoun. 
So if you are a woman or if you are a man, when referring to yourself and saying I, whatever, whatever, you would use the same pronoun. Likewise, you would use the same pronoun when you are saying we. We would like to go somewhere. The pronoun in Arabic for we is the same regardless of gender. So that simplifies things for us a little bit. And also there is no dual form for the first person. So this slot is actually not filled. And furthermore, there is repetition for the second and third person dual pronouns. Basically, these two slots are filled by the same word, by the same pronoun. They are identical. And these two slots over here are filled by the same pronoun. So that's how we get the number 12. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. 12 unique standalone personal pronouns. In this lesson, we are only going to learn the pronouns in this column, the singular ones. In future lessons, we will fill in the remaining slots. But right now, we will concern ourselves with the singular pronouns, and here they are. We have huwa for the third person singular masculine pronoun. Huwa means he, he or it. Hiya means she, she or it. That's the third person singular feminine pronoun. Now, I have parentheses around the word it behind he and she. And that's because, remember in Arabic, everything has a gender. Everything including inanimate, non-human, dead objects. All of these things have gender. So we refer to them as who and he in Arabic. But of course, in English, we say it. We don't say he or she. We don't describe a rock as he or she, we say it. But in Arabic, it would be huwa or hiya. Next, we have the second person singular pronouns, anta, referring to you, male singular, you. And you would use this pronoun when you're talking to a male individual. And then we have the female counterpart, anti, anti, for you, female singular. And you would use this when you're talking to a woman. To a female individual. So you have anta and anti, both mean you. And lastly, we have ana. Ana refers to I when you're talking about yourself. And you would use this pronoun again regardless of your gender. So there's no gender differentiation for the first person. Let's go through these pronouns again. We have huwa for he, hiya for she, anta for you, masculine, anti for you, feminine, and ana for I. And that's used for both genders. Huwa, hiya, anta, anti, and ana. And you should memorize these pronouns, inshallah. Before we begin our discussion of verbs, I want to show you a few examples from the Quran. And these verses contain al-dhamair al-munfasila, standalone personal pronouns. Just to show you that I'm telling you the truth. I will take examples from the Quran. So here we are. Verse number one. This is verse nine of Surah, uh, Surah number 42. Allah says, And in this verse, we have three instances of the pronoun huwa. Huwa. Fallahu huwa al and Allah, He is the guardian. He is the protector. And He brings life to, to the dead. And He is over all things able and powerful. He is capable over all things. So in this verse, in this ayah, we have the pronoun huwa repeated three times referring to Allah. Referring to Allah. Example number two, verses 42 and 49 from Surah uh, An-Nazi'at, Surah number 79. Ayyana mu'saha fima anta min the pronoun here is anta. This is actually referring to a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says, Yas'alunaka anissa'ati ayyana mu'saha. They ask you, referring to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
عن الساعة about the hour about the last day أيان المرساها when is it coming when is its arrival they ask you about the final hour judgment day when is its arrival فيما أنت من ذكرها in what position are you to talk about it and what do you have to mention it فيما أنت this pronoun أنت means you Right, it's the second person, masculine singular pronoun, anta, referring to the Prophet. And in the last example, verse number 14 from Surah Taha, Allah says, Innani ana Allahu la ilaha illa ana fa'budni, fa'budni wa aqimi salata li vikri. In this verse, we have two instances of the pronoun ana, which means I. Ana, which means I. And Allah says, indeed, I am Allah, and Allah, la ilaha illa ana, there is no God but I, fa'abudini, so worship me, and establish prayer for my for my remembrance. Welcome to Salat al-Dhikri. And in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to uh, the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. So these are examples of al-Dhamair al-Munfasilah taken from the Qur'an. Topic number three for today's lesson, an overview of af'al, an overview of verbs. The Arabic word for verb is fi'l, and the plural form is af'al. I want to discuss very briefly three different aspects or three different facets of verbs in a very global and very general sense. Number one is verb conjugation. Number two, uh, the system of roots and the system of derivation in Arabic. And last but not least, the idea of verb forms or verb patterns in Arabic. So let's begin with conjugation. Conjugation simply means to change a verb to make it appropriate for a particular person and a particular tense. So verbs in Arabic are conjugated for the past tense, the present tense, and the command form. Again, verbs are conjugated for the past, and the present tenses and the command form. Now you may be wondering where does the future tense fall in all of this? The future tense isn't a main category in Arabic and that's because it's simply an extension of the present tense structure. So the future tense is basically the same thing as the present tense in Arabic grammar. Now concept number two is the idea of roots. Arabic asma and af'al are derived from roots. What are roots? They are three or four root letters. So three or four letters from the Arabic alphabet. Words derived from the same root letters belong to the same family. So an easy way to think of roots is to think of them as building blocks. You have three or four unique building blocks from which you can assemble a wide and diverse array of words. And all of these words because they can be traced to the same root letters, they belong in the same family, a very large family of words. And they generally share the same basic meaning in some way or another, which is super neat, in my opinion at least. Now I want to show you by example how the root system functions in Arabic so you get a better feel for how words are derived from their basic building blocks. So here we have a set of words. We have Salam, Islam, Salim, Muslim, and Istalama. Salam, Islam, Salim, Muslim, and Istalama. You want to ask yourself at this point, which letters are repeated most often? Which letters are repeated in every single word? Because those are the root letters shared by these words. And those letters are Sin, Lam, and Mim. Salama, Sin, Lam, and Mim. Let's consider a second set of words. We have kitab, maktab, maktub, istiktab, and katib. These words all share the root letters kaf, ta, and ba. Kaf, ta, and ba. And the last set, we have khalfa, khilaf, khalifa, ikhtilaf, mukhtalif. These words all belong in one set because they share the root letters kha, lam, and fa. Kha, lam, and fa. 
So I hope this exercise gives you a better feel for roots and how words can be related by root letters if you break them down. And I'm not going to discuss the meanings of each word, but um, take my word for it at this point that they are all related somehow in some way or another to each other by virtue of sharing the same basic building blocks. Concept number three is the concept of the verb form, also called the verb pattern. And the Arabic word for verb form is wazn, wazn. The plural form of that is awzan. So when we say a wazn, we're talking about a verb form. The best way to illustrate this idea or this concept is, of course, by way of example. So I want you to consider, again, three sets of different verbs. And each set is going to be broken down into these three categories. We have the past tense of a verb, the present tense of that verb, and the verbal noun. And the verbal noun is called the mustar in Arabic, al mustar And this refers to the noun form of that verb. We have the same thing in English. So I could say, for instance, I ran to the park. I ran to the park. In this sentence, ran is the verb. But if I say running is fun, running is fun, the, the word running acts as a noun. That's called the verbal noun because it describes the idea, the concept of the verb. And the same thing exists in Arabic. But don't worry too much about this right now. We will go in much more detail about the muslim, about the verbal noun in future lessons. But for this exercise, I want you to listen very carefully to the phonetic similarities between three sets of verbs because all of these verbs follow the same pattern, the same form. So number one, we have salama for the past tense, yusallimu for the present tense, and at-taslim for the verbal noun. Salama yusallimu at-taslim. What are the root letters? They are seen, lam, and meme for this particular verb. Verb set number two, we have for the past tense, rakaza, yurakizu for the present, at for the verbal noun. And the root letters are ra, kaf, and zai. Rakaza, yurakizu, at And verb number three, darrasa, yudarrisu, at the root letters being dal, ra, and sin. Darwasa yudarisu at tadris. Now, these three verbs, like I mentioned, follow the same form. Again, let's pay attention to the similarities in how they sound. Salama, rakaza, darwasa. We hear that shadda in the center. And of course, all the letters take a fatha. They're all maftuh. We can say that these verbs in the past tense fits onto the same pattern and that pattern is fa'ala fa'ala where the fa the ayn and the lam serve as variable placeholders they can be replaced by any set of root letters so if we replace the fa the ayn and lam by seen lam and mim respectively we get the verb salama and we can do the same for rakaza and darrasa. So all three verbs fit again onto this form, onto this pattern, fa'ala. The same can be said about the present tense verbs. Yusallimu, yurakizu, yudarrisu. Notice how they all say, sound very similar. That's because they fit onto the same pattern. And that generic pattern is yufa'ilu, yufa'ilu. Again, the fa'ayn and lam serve as variables they can be replaced by roots, any set of roots. And if we replace the fa, the ayn, and lam with the, ra, and sin, for example, we get the verb yudarrisu. And the same can be done for the other verbs. Yufa'ilu. And lastly, we have the verbal noun. Let's listen again. At-taslim, at-tarkiz, at-tadris. All three fit onto the pattern. At-taf'il, at-taf'il. Where again the fa, the ayn, and lam act as variable roots. So the fa, the ayn, and lam can represent any root letters, they act as variables. This last 
row down here. Fa'ala yufa'ilu at-taf'il. These three constitute a particular set. And that is what we refer to as the wazan, the verb form. Okay? These three constitute a verb form, a verb pattern, a wazan. And in reality, this is actually form two. It's called form number two. So we would call salama a form two verb because it fits onto this pattern. Salama yusallimu at-taslim fits the pattern. Fa'ala yufa'ilu at-taf'il. We call it a form two verb. Likewise, we call rakaza a form two verb. And we also call darrasa a form two verb. So right here, in summary, verb forms or patterns, wasn, the Arabic word is wasn for verb form, these are fixed patterns or blueprints that verbs follow. You can think of them as generic stencils or molds, and whatever verb fits that particular mold, we call it by that form. So salama fits the form, the generic stencil, structure or blueprint of fa'ala, it is called a form 2 verb. There are 10 verb forms in use today, 10, and they are called form 1, form 2, form 3, etc. until form 10, and we describe them using Roman numerals. That is convention, that's just how it works. So Roman numeral 1, 2, 3, 4, up until 10. Form 9 is not very common, and form 1 is a bit complicated, so you won't see form 9 a lot or at all. And form 1 is complicated. By that, I mean form 1 has many different variations within it. But the other 8 forms, forms 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 10 are highly regular. They are highly regular and highly standard. Thus, they are memorized as such. And I would encourage you to memorize them as well. We memorize them like this. Form 2, fa'ala yufa'ilu at-taf'il. Just like that. Form 2, fa'ala yufa'ilu at tafrin as an entire set. Why do we memorize verb forms? Why do we memorize awzan? Because they are so powerful in giving us the ability to predict, to accurately predict structures and morphological changes of a particular verb. And I'm going to show you how that works in the following slide. Because the wasn, each wasn entails a fixed past, present, and verbal form. If you memorize the wasn, if you memorize the wasn, you will instantly know all, all the morphological changes of the verb given a single instance or a single example of that verb. Right here we have verb yusallimu. If you've memorized the awzan, you know that this fits onto the pattern yufa'ilu. Yusallimu, yufa'ilu, they sound alike. We know also that this is a form 2 verb because we've memorized the wasn. Yufa'ilu is form 2, so we know yusallimu is a form 2 verb. Now, the other two components we've also memorized, fa'ala and at-taf'il, these all come in a set, and that allows us to predict the past tense and the, and the verbal noun forms of yusallimu, and they are sallama and at-taslim. Again, if you've memorized the wasn, you can predict the past tense and the verbal given the present, or you can present you can predict the past tense. Uh, you sorry, you can predict the present and the verbal given the past tense, or you can predict the past tense and the present given the verbal. Whatever form you're given, however it is conjugated, if you know the wasn, you can derive all the other forms. So we know that you salimu fits onto the pattern you fa'ilu. We know it's a form 2 verb. We know that form 2 goes like fa'ala yufa'ilu at taf'il. So we can derive salama yusallimu at taslim. In reality, it works much faster than that. So if you've memorized your awzan and if your memorization is very solid, it works literally in a second. So this is how I think. I see the word yusallimu. I know it's form 2. And I can predict Salama at Taslim instantaneously. It works literally this fast. Just like that. It takes less than a second. Yusallimu, I've identified as a form two verb, and from there I know the past tense and the mustar and the verbal noun form. 
So this slide summarizes for you the importance of understanding root letters and the importance of knowing your verb forms or the auxan and to fully grasp the Arabic language and to fully appreciate its beauty you have to know how root letters work and you have to know your verb patterns. Understanding root letters allows you to number one use a dictionary and by dictionary I'm referring to the Hans Ver English Arabic dictionary, the Hans Ver dictionary in which words are organized based on root letters. So if you see a word that you don't know and you are able to identify its root letters, you can look it up in the dictionary and you will find it under its building blocks, its root letters. Number two, understanding root letters allows you to appreciate the interconnected meanings of words. Like I mentioned before, all words that can be traced to the same raw material building blocks, i.e. the same root letters, are basically in the same family. They belong to the same family and they share the same underlying meaning, the same basic underlying meaning. Number three, understanding root letters allows you to understand the derivation of many, many, many different nouns, verbs, and adjectives. Because Arabic is a very structured language. It is a language of patterns, it is a language of trends, and a language of structure. So there is structure and forms for nouns. There are structures and forms for verbs, like we learned. There are structures and forms for plurals and for adjectives. If you understand these structures and you understand root letters, you really understand the morphological changes and transformations of the majority of words in the language. Okay, Because words can really be broken down into root letters and structure. Root letters and structure. You're imposing, you're superimposing root letters onto forms and structures to create words. That's really how it works. Memorizing verb patterns, number one, allows you to look up verbs in the dictionary by form number. And the form numbers are, again, Roman numerals. So if you see Roman numeral two, that refers to verb form number two. Memorizing verb patterns also allows you to instantly know the past, present, and verbal noun forms given any of the three. And I illustrated this with an example earlier. When I gave you the present tense, you said limu. Knowing the verb form, the verb pattern, you identified the verb as form two verb, and you instantly derived the past and the verbal noun forms. And you can also fully conjugate the verb for all pronouns in these forms. That's the power of the verb form, the wasn't in Arabic. If you memorize a simple pattern, a simple stencil, you basically have near complete mastery over the morphological changes over the full range of morphological changes and transformations that that verb can go through. You can conjugate that verb for all pronouns in all tenses for each person. At this point, I want to show you and give you a glimpse, a very quick and brief glimpse of verb conjugation in Arabic. And I'm going to show you using a splitting tree all the different tenses that verbs can be conjugated for. So in the center we have al-fi'l, which means the verb. Like I mentioned before, there are three main tenses or forms. We have the past tense, the present tense, and the command form. These are the three major categories of conjugation. Here they are. Al-fi'l al-maldi refers to the past tense. Al-fi'l al-mudari' is the present tense. And al-fi'l al-amr is the command. We also have the idea of the masdar, which I talked about in passing a few moments ago. This is the verbal noun. And that refers to the concept or the idea of that verb. Now keep in mind, this is an ism. It is not a verb. It is not a fi'l. It is an ism. It is not a fi'l. But it is memorized as part of the verb wasn because it is predictable and follows a highly predictable and highly regular structure. So we memorize it as part of the wasn. We memorize the past tense, the present tense, and the verbal noun together as one set.
The command form is not generally memorized because we can derive it from the present tense, although it is recognized as a distinct category because of the grammar rules that it entails. The present tense can further be divided into three more groups. Here we are. We can have marfu', mansub, or majzum. So we can have al fi'l, al mudari', al marfu', al fi'l, al mudari', al mansub, al fi'l, al mudari', al majzum. These are three types of present tense verbs. And again, you may be wondering where does the future tense fall in all of this? The future tense is simply an extension of the marfu' verb. It's called al-mustaqbal, al-mustaqbal, and that's the future tense. In fact, it's actually identical to the marfu' verb, the fi'l mudari' marfu'. You simply add a particle, a harf, in front of it. So this is the full splitting tree of verbs. In Arabic, let me, let me give you a few examples at this point. We have kataba, which means he wrote. Kataba, he wrote, that's a past tense verb, fi'l al maldi. Now, in the present tense, we can have three different versions. We can have yaktubu for the marfu' form. We can have yaktuba for the mansub, and yaktub for the majzum form. Notice how these three verbs are very, very similar. In fact, they're nearly identical, except for their case ending. Yaktubu with a lamma, yaktuba with a fatha, yaktub with a sukun. And we will talk about why each verb, each type of mudari' takes the case ending that it does. And the command, of course, is uktub, which means write when you're commanding someone to do so. Uktub. And the future tense is sayaktubu. So notice how these two are identical, except in the future tense we've added a particle, a harf in front, sa, to signify the future, sayaktubu. So again, this is the full splitting tree of Arabic verb conjugation. Do not worry about these categories. In this lesson, we are going to focus on the past tense verb, al fi' al maldi. So just focus on this branch right here. In this lesson and the next lesson, we'll work with al fi' al maldi, the past tense verb. The reason I gave you everything right now is so you can have a big picture and this serves as a roadmap so you know where, where we are headed. After we talk about the past tense verb, we'll dive in and talk about the present tense. And afterwards, we'll talk about the command and the future and the mustal. Topic number four, finally. In this particular section, we are going to learn formally how to conjugate verbs in the past tense. We will be using the form one verb. Form one is the most basic wasn. It is composed of just the root letters. And we are going to learn the past tense conjugation of the form one verb for the standalone personal pronouns that we learned today. So if you remember, standalone personal pronouns are called al-dhamair al-munfasila, al-dhamair al-munfasila. And the reason we're working with the form one verb is because I want to teach you the patterns for conjugation first. The patterns for conjugation. And these patterns can be applied to all verbs of any form. Well, form one is the most basic form. It's the easiest form to work with. So that's why we're beginning with form one. But again, the patterns for conjugation, which we'll, you will learn in just a second, are true and can be applied for any verb. Let's begin. Here is a review of Al-Dhamair Al-Munfasila, which you learned a few minutes ago. We have Huwa, which means he, Hiya, which means she, Anta, which means you, Anti, which also means you. Anta is for the masculine, and Anti is for the feminine. And Ana, which means I, and it works for both genders. So here are the pronouns we learned today. Now we are going to learn conjugation. So, huwa means he. The verb is fa'ala. Huwa fa'ala. Fa'ala is the most basic verb. It's a form one verb. And notice how we are using the variable, the variable roots, fa'ainala. 
The verb fa'ala actually means he did in Arabic. It means he did. So we are conjugating it for the pronoun huwa in the past tense. So when you say fa'ala, it means he did. Hiya, we would say fa'alat. Fa'alat. We've added a ta with a sukun. A ta sakina to the end of the verb fa'ala. Hiya fa'alat means she did. She did. To conjugate for anta, we would say fa'alta. Fa'alta. We've added a sukun on top of the lam and we've added a ta with a fatha. Now, this ta with a fatha, ta maftuha, corresponds to the ta in anta. So, this makes sense. Anta fa'alta. It rhymes as well. Anta fa'alta. This means you did in the past tense. Conjugating for anti, we say fa'alti. Fa'alti. The t corresponds to the t in anti. Again, it rhymes. This helps us. Uh, memorize this conjugation scheme anti fa'alti which means you did but again we're referring to the feminine you anti fa'alti and last but not least ana i ana fa'altu ana fa'altu the two ta with a lama on top corresponds to ana ana fa'altu which means i did now these patterns, the ta with the sukun, the ta with the fatha, the ta with the kasra, and the ta with the lamma, this conjugation scheme is true for any verb in the Arabic language. And I'm going to demonstrate this with examples later on. Now, in English, we say he did, she did, you did, you did, and I did. The verb is the same for every single pronoun. Did, 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 and did. If I just say did in English, you don't know who, who performed the action of doing, who did. But in Arabic, the conjugation of the verb tells you the person and tells you the gender and tells you the tense, right? So if I say fa'alat, that means she did. We don't need to say hiya fa'alat. We can just say fa'alat. We don't need to say anta fa'alta. We just need to say fa'alta. That ta at the end of the verb tells you who's doing the action. It tells you that anta is doing the action, fa'alta. We don't need to say anti fa'alti, we can just say fa'alti. And we don't need to say ana fa'altu, we can just say fa'altu. So we can actually remove the pronouns. And these verbs just by themselves would make perfect sense because they will tell us the person. We cannot do that in English. In English, we need to have the personal pronouns in front. Now, I mentioned earlier that the form one verb is a little complicated because there are variations within it. And at this point, we're going to discuss those variations, at least for the past tense. So the middle root, the ayn, the middle variable, can take any haraka in theory. So it can take a fatha or it can take a lamma. So you can have this form, fa'ula. There are verbs that fit this pattern, fa'ula. But the conjugation scheme is the same. So if we have fa'ula for huwa, the hiya form would be fa'ulat. Fa'ulat. We're adding a ta sakina at the end for hiya. The anta form, we predict, will have a ta at the end. And that is certainly the case. We have fa'ulta. Fa'ulta. Notice how the ayn with the lama is carried through. That's part of the verb itself. It doesn't change. Anti, we predict that it would have a T at the end because this marks the pronoun. Anti, there's a correspondence. And that is again the case. Fa'ulti. Fa'ulti. And ana, we predict, would have a tu. Fa'ultu. So again, let's go through this list. We have huwa fa'ula, hiya fa'ul, fa'ulat, anta fa'ulta, anti fa'ulti, ana fa'ultu. And the last possible haraka is the kasra. So we can have fa'ala or fa'ula or fa'ila. Fa'ila with a kasra. These three verbs are all considered form one verbs. And that's the variation inherent in form one is that the middle word can have a variable haraka. It can be a fatha, 
adama or kasra. So fa'ala is a form one verb, fa'ula is a form one verb, and fa'ila is a form one verb. Again, in the next few slides, I will show you actual examples of verbs that follow these patterns. For fa'ila, we conjugate in the same way. Hiya fa'ilat, anta fa'ilta, anti fa'ilti, ana fa'iltu. Let's now take a look at a real verb. This verb is going to follow the pattern of fa'ala, the most basic fa'ala pattern for huwa. On the left hand side, I've given you the stencils, the stencil blueprints, if you need them, but I would encourage you not to look at this, these blueprints for now and just work off of your memory or work with me because that will train you to, to recognize and to use the forms. So huwa, I'm going to give you the verb right now and we're going to conjugate it for each of these pronouns. Huwa khalaqa, khalaqa. Notice how this follows the pattern fa'ala, fa'ala. What are the root letters? They are kha, lam, and qaf. Very basic verb. How do we conjugate it for hiya? We add a ta with a sukun, a ta with a sukun. Khalaqat, khalaqat, anta, would have a ta with a fatha at the end. Anta khalaqta. Anta khalaqta. Anti khalaqti. Anti khalaqti. With a t at the end. And ana khalaqtu. Ana khalaqtu. So that's the conjugation scheme for the verb khalaqa. We have khalaqa, khalaqat. Khalaqta, khalaqti, khalaqtu. What does this verb mean? It means to create. So khalaqa means he created. If we're talking about he or she, we would say she created. Anti khalaqta, you created. Anti khalaqti, you created, talking to a female. And ana khalaqtu, I created. Example number two, we're going to look at a verb that follows the pattern fa'ula, fa'ula, where the middle root, the second root, takes a dhamma. Again, this is considered a form one verb. It's simply a variation of fa'ala, but it follows the same conjugation pattern. The verb is basura. basura. How do we conjugate it for hiya? We add a ta with a sakina. Basurat, basurat. How do we conjugate it for anta? Basurta, basurta. We're adding a ta at the end, corresponding to the ta in anta. Anti would have a T at the end, basurti, anti basurti, and ana basurtu. The two refers to ana, ana basurtu. What does this verb mean? Basura means to look or to see. So, huwa basura, or just basura means he looked. Basurat, she looked. Basurta, you looked, referring to Anta, you, masculine. Basurti, you looked, referring to anti, you, feminine. And basurtu, I looked. I looked. So this is an example of a verb following the pattern fa'ula, fa'ula, and it is still a form one verb. And the last possible combination is fa'ila, fa'ila, in which the middle root takes a kasra. And this is again considered a form one verb, one of the variations of the form one verb, in addition to fa'ala and fa'ula. The verb is kadiha, kadiha. The hiya form will be karihat, karihat, we're adding a ta sakina. Anta karihta, anti karihti, wa ana karihtu. And this verb means to hate or det to detest. So kariha means he hated, karihat she hated, karihta you hated, karihti you hated for feminine, and karihtu I hated. And this verb usually takes a direct object, but that's not our concern over here, so I didn't add anything afterwards. So at this point, hopefully the conjugation for the form one verb in the past tense for the singular pronouns that we learned today, the singular standalone personal pronouns. Um, these conjugation patterns should be very clear to you. If they are not, please review the previous slides and watch them a few times. At this point, I want to take a look at a few examples taken from the Quran.
And for each example, I want you to ask yourself a few questions. So I want, to ask, I want you to ask yourself, how is the verb conjugated? What changes have we made to it? And what do those changes tell us about the pronoun for which it is conjugated? And last but not least, who is doing the action of the verb? So verse number one, this is from Surah Al-Baqarah, verse seven. Allah says, خَتَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ سَمْعِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ أَبْصَارِهِمْ غِشَاوَةٍ خَتَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ Allah has placed a seal upon their hearts وَعَلَىٰ سَمْعِهِمْ and upon their hearing وَعَلَىٰ أَبْصَارِهِمْ غِشَاوَةٍ and over their sights, over their eyes is a cover, is a cover or a veil. And the verb in this ayah is khatama, khatama. Notice how it follows the pattern of fa'ala. And from that we know it is conjugated for huwa. And who is doing the action? Allah is. Allah, huwa, in other words, Allah has placed a seal. So khatama means to place a seal. It is conjugated for huwa in this ayah, referring to Allah who is doing the action. Example number two. This is verse number 16 from Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2. Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ اشْتَرَوُ الضَّلَالَةَ بِالْهُدَىٰ فَمَا رَبِحَتْ تِجَارَتُهُمْ The verb here is رَبِحَتْ رَبِحَتْ We notice the ta sakina or ta with the sukun, the very light ta at the end of the word, رَبِحَتْ So we know the conjugation is for the pronoun hiya. She, he, uh, she. And who is doing the action? Tijaratuhum. Fama rabi had tijaratuhum. It is conjugated for tijarah, which is feminine. And the meaning is basically their, their transaction or their business did not profit them, it was unprofitable. So the verb is conjugated for he, uh, and the thing doing the action is tijarah. أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ اشْتَرَوُ الضَّلَالَةَ بِالْهُدَىٰ أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ They have, um, they are those who have purchased or traded الضَّلَالَة misguidance for guidance and their transaction or purchase did not, was not, was of no benefit. فَمَا رَبِحَتْ تِجَارَتُهُمْ Example number three, Verse number two, taken from Surah Al-Alaq. The verb here is خَلَقَ which we actually conjugated in the previous slides. خَلَقَ is conjugated for huwa. It falls neatly under the pattern. فَعَلَ and refers to Allah. Allah is the one who created man from clot. I also forgot to mention, Rabihat follows the pattern Fa'ilat. Fa'ilat. For the verb Rabiha or Fa'ila. Example number four. This is verse 33, taken from Surah number 28. Allah says, Qala Rabbi inni qataltu minhum nafsan fa'akhafu an yaqutulun. This is actually Musa speaking to Allah. Musa is saying, My Lord, I have killed from them a person, and I fear that they will kill me. This is Musa talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The verb here that we care about is qataltu. Qataltu. This follows the pattern fa'altu. Fa'altu. So the basic verb is fa'ala or qatala and there is a ta with a lama at the end, a tu, referring to ana or I. Ana or I. That's the pronoun that the verb is conjugated for. Who is doing the action? Musa is the one doing the action. He is saying, inni qataltu. Indeed, I have killed. He's talking about himself. I have killed from them someone. I've killed an in individual from among them. Qataltu. After the pattern, fa'altu. We have some more examples. Qala ya Iblisu. Allah says, Ya Iblis, ma mana'aka, what prevented you from prostrating to that which I have created with my two hands? The verb here is khalaqtu, khalaqtu, which we conjugated earlier. 
We notice the to at the end, this is referring to the pronoun ana. It's conjugated for ana, the pronoun I. And who is speaking? Allah is the one speaking. So Allah is saying to Iblis, what prevented you from prostrating to that which I created with my two hands? And this follows a pattern, fa'altu, fa'altu. And the basic verb is khalaqa, fa'ala khalaqa. Next, next example, Allah says in verse number 96 of Surah Taha, number 20, qala basurtu bima lam yabsuru bih. The verb here is basurtu, basurtu. This is conjugated for ana because of the tu at the end. The ta with the lama at the end. Basultu, conjugated for ana. The pattern is fa'ultu, fa'ultu, in which the middle root takes a lama. In the next example, we have in verse number 11 of surah number 28, al qasas وَقَالَتْ لِأُخْتِهِ قُصِّيهِ فَبَصُرَتْ بِهِ عَنْ جُنُوبِ The verb here is بَصُرَتْ بَصُرَتْ فَبَصُرَتْ فا uh, You can ignore that for now. The verb is بَصُرَتْ This is after the pattern فَعُلَتْ We hear the t, t at the end, the تَ سَكِنَةَ This tells us the verb is conjugated for هِيَ So she is doing this action. وَقَالَتْ لِأُخْتِهِ قُصِّيهِ فَبَصُرَتْ بِهِ عَنْ جُنُوبِ This is talking about the sister of Fir'aun, uh, sorry, the sister of Musa, who was sent by their mother to keep an eye out for Musa, right? After Musa's mother drops Musa alayhi salam in the river, and he ends up in the house of Fir'aun, um, his mother is worried about him, so she sends Musa's sister to check him out to examine him from a distance and she watched him from a distance this is conjugated for here and the last example from surah taha verse number 40 the verb we care about here is it is conjugated we hear the ta at the end is conjugated for anta. It rhymes anta qatalta. So you killed and you killed. This is Allah talking to Musa. And you killed a man from among them. And you killed a man. Now we haven't talked about the following types of verbs yet which will appear in just a second. Some belong to higher forms, such as form 2, 3, and 4, etc. And others are irregular form 1 verbs. And we will talk about these again in much more detail in the future. But the past tense conjugation rules, the conjugation schemes that we talked about in this lesson apply to all verbs. So if you add a ta, a ta with the sakina to the end of a past tense verb, you're conjugating for hiya. If you add ta maftuha, a ta with a fatha to the end of the verb, you're conjugating for anta. If you add a t, you're conjugating for anti. And if you add a tu, you're conjugating for ana. Ittakhadat, ittakhadat is a form 8 verb. We don't know what it means, and at this point we don't care, but we see that at the end, this tells us it's conjugated for hiya in the past tense. So she is doing this action, whatever it is. Qulta, we see the ta, this tells us the verb is conjugated for anta. Aslamti, we know the verb is conjugated for anti. Qalat, we know it's conjugated for hiya. Intaqalat, we know it's conjugated for hiya. Qadaytu, we know it's conjugated for ana because of the two. Ta'akharta, we know it's conjugated for anta because of the ta. Qarartu, it's conjugated for ana because of the two. And sallayti, it's conjugated for anti because of the t. So these, again, these past tense conjugation rules apply to all verbs regardless of form and regularity. Here is the lesson two review. We learned in this lesson that personal pronouns are of two types. They are either 
Al-Dama'ir Al-Munfasilah, standalone pronouns, or they can be attached. Al-Dama'ir Al-Muttasilah. We also learned the following Al-Dama'ir Al-Munfasilah, the following standalone personal pronouns. We learned about Huwa, which is he, Hiya, which is she, Anti for you feminine, Anta for you masculine, and Ana for I. And that works for both genders. We learned that verbs are conjugated in the past tense, al maldi the present tense, al mudarir and the command, Al-Amr. Arabic words are derived from roots, three or four letters, and these roots serve as the basic building blocks from which other words can be formed. There are ten verb forms in the Arabic language that are in use today, and they are numbered form 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. to form number 10 using Roman numerals. A verb form or a wazin is a fixed pattern for the past tense, the present tense, and the verbal noun. Verbal nouns are nouns, they are not verbs, but they have predictable forms and thus are memorized along with the past and the present in the wazin. And last but not least, we learned the following conjugation rules for the past tense, for the past tense verb and for the form 1 verb. So we learn huwa fa'ala, hiya fa'alat, anta fa'alta, anti fa'alti, and ana fa'altu. And these conjugation rules apply to all past tense verbs regardless of form and regardless of whether the verb may be irregular or regular. This is the end of lesson number two. Thank you for watching.